Hi everyone. Good day to you, wherever you are. And I welcome you to the finest music drama channel. Sharing the love of finest literature. Just lie down on an easy chair. Throw your cares off your mind. Think of nothing but the temperature of your drink. I hope you will enjoy today's dramatization. Your comments are much appreciated. Please support the love of finest literature by subscribing and sharing the channel with friends to get updated on future releases. I will make a short introduction to Miss Marple's final cases. Then we will enjoy the dramatization afterward. This is great, and don't let the title of the collection fool you. It might be the last Miss Marple book, but you can get away with reading them out of order and I thought this would be a great one for someone who's looking to get into the series. That's because it's a short story collection rather than a novel, so it packs a bunch of different plot lines into one and uses Miss Marple to tie it all together. It's an odd collection, there is no final farewell, merely Marple's solving of the cases. They serve as a sign-off a point for Agatha Christie's most famous female detective. It have characters and plots which lead up to the elderly sleuth intervening and solving each mystery she is presented with. She uses her observations of human nature from a living in a small village to apply logic and sense to things that others may not have given credence to especially younger people. In a gentle, chiding manner she draws each character back to the details, and that if you really observe, then you will have noticed a precedent for that behavior somewhere else. Always ingenious, yet once explained. Blindingly obvious she is the opposite of Poirot whose world travels and experience has shown him the darkest sides of human nature, Miss Marple uses her elderly gentle lady stature and general invisibility to wider society to correct wrongs. This was a delightful read and as always, it is fun to admire Miss Marple's spunk. No wonder they called Christie the Queen of Mystery. Let listen to the dramatization. <laughs> Mrs. Spenlow? Hello? Mrs. Spenlow? Miss Hartnell! Oh, Miss Paulette! Excuse me for troubling you, but do you happen to know if by any chance Mrs. Spenlow isn't at home? I haven't the faintest idea. It's rather awkward, you see. I, I was to come and fit her new dress this afternoon. 3.30, she said. I, I was wondering if maybe she might have gone out and forgotten. It's the maid's day off. I expect she's just fallen asleep. You probably haven't made enough noise with this thing. Oh. Want her within there? No, no, she must have gone out after all. I'll call round some other time. Nonsense! She can't have gone out. I'd have bumped into her in the village. So I'll just peep through the windows, see if I can see any signs of... What is it? It's... It's Mrs. Spenlow. I think she's... dead. Agatha Christie's Tape Measure Murder. Dramatised by Joy Wilkinson. No, Bunch, please leave them closed. Come along now, Aunt Jane. Dr. Haydock said I was to take things slowly. He also said that you're better now. Mm. Your fever's gone. You have to start getting back to yourself again. Myself? Why would I want to go back to being that? An old woman. Ah, yes. He said depression was a common after effect. You are a very beautiful goddaughter, Bunch. But you should be back at the rectory with your husband. You've got your whole life ahead of you, whereas I... I was wrong. What you need is to get out of yourself. Occupy your mind with something else. Why don't you look through your wardrobe and decide which clothes you want Miss Pollitt to water? You've lost so much weight. I don't want my clothes altering. 
I don't want to get dressed. Well, what about this new book of Raymond's? He sent it specially to keep your spirits up. Well, I can't think of anything more likely to make me depressed. His awful stories about unpleasant young men and women killing each other for no good reason. I'm sure it's all very modern, but I am not. I'm afraid I am hopelessly Victorian. Past my time. Oh, you'll make a start on the book. I'll be back in a moment. Oh. The nylon noose. Hmm. Mickey hates Cynthia. Cynthia hates Betty. Betty hates Mickey. Oh, there's only one way out of this deadly triangle of passion. Oh. The book will have to wait. Miss Hartnell's here to see you. Oh, tell her I'm too ill for visitors. She won't take no for an answer. And I think you'll want to talk to her. Mrs. Spenlow's been murdered. Lying on the hearthrug in the sitting room, <gasps> in her kimono, strangled. Would you like some tea, Aunt Jane? Oh, no, thank you, Bunch. Go on, Miss Hartnell. And, of course, I managed to keep my head. That pollock creature wouldn't have had the least idea what to do. Got to keep our heads, I said to her. You stay here, and I'll go and fetch the police. One has to be firm with that sort of person. I've always found they rather enjoy making a fuss. Yes, that can often be the case. So, I was just going off when, at that very moment, who should come walking around the corner of the house but Mr. Spenlow? How did he look? Frankly, I suspected something at once. He was far too calm. When you first saw him, or when he heard the news? Well, from the very first, and throughout. He didn't seem surprised in the least. And you may say what you like, but it isn't natural for a man to hear that his wife is dead and then display no emotion whatsoever. Perhaps he was in shock. Perhaps. It's more likely that he was thinking about the will. Money was all hers, of course, and she's left it all to him. Oh, dear. That is suspicious. No, Arthur Spenlow did it. I have no doubt in my mind. But for some reason, they haven't arrested him yet. Which is why I thought I'd pop in and see you. Inspector Slack said he's not taking any further action until he's spoken to Miss Mop. Oh, Edna's out shopping. I'd better go and get that. I don't understand. Why would Inspector Slack want to speak to me? That's what I want to know. Hmm... It's Inspector Slack. He wants to see you. What did I tell you? Let me show you out, Miss Hartnell. Oh, what? Uh, right away? Oh, well, um, yes, I suppose so, if I must. Uh, you will be sure to tell me what he says, won't you? Oh, I'm sure it's nothing. <clears throat> Thank you for calling. Now, tea. A statement was made to me by Mr. Arthur Spenlow, husband of the deceased Dorothy Spenlow. He said that at uh, 2.30, as far as he can say, he was rung up by Miss Marple and asked if he would come over at quarter past three as she was anxious to consult him about something. Now, Miss Marple, is that true? Certainly not. You did not ring up Mr. Spenlow at 2.30? Neither at 2.30, nor at any other time. What else did he say? Uh, that he uh, came over here, as requested, leaving his own house at ten past three. But that on arrival here, he was informed by the maidservant that Miss Marple was resting and not to be disturbed. That part of it may well be true. Edna was instructed that I wasn't receiving visitors, at least until Bunch, um, Mrs Harmon, arrived and overruled me. Bunch would have arrived at around 3.30. By which time Mr Spenlow, if he was ever here, would have left. He claims that he took a short stroll down by the river and returned home by the back gate. Tell me, Inspector, do you suspect him of murdering his wife? <laughs> you know I cannot divulge such information at this stage, Miss Marple. Oh, of course not. <laughs> I don't mean to interfere... But as my name has been dragged into the matter, I'm just trying to imagine why on earth Mr. Spenlow would say these things about me that aren't true. Well, uh, let's just say it looks to me as though somebody, naming no names, has attempted to be artful and failed. Mm -hmm. 
There's a pin in your jacket. What? Oh, yes. Uh, my grandmother always told me, see a pin and pick it up. All the day you'll have good luck. <laughs> well, I hope that will come true. No doubt it will, Miss Wopple. I believe we'll have our man by the end of the day. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'd better go and track down Edna, see if Mr Spenlow really was here at all, and if so, for how long? Do you want me to make you something to eat, Aunt Jane? How about a sandwich? Did Edna mention anything to you about Mr Spenlow? She said he'd called by a little while before I arrived. He seemed a little confused, but went on his way. That rather seems to fit well with what he told Inspector Slack. Although... Isn't that exactly what Mr. Spenlow would have done if he were making that his alibi? Hmm. I might have a piece of toast if it isn't too much trouble. I knew you'd start to feel better being up and about. I've always liked Mr. Spenlow. Well, no, that's not quite true. When I first met him, there was something amiss. He'd so clearly lived in towns all of his life, it seemed odd that he should come to live here. But then... One day, when I saw him tending to his roses, he confided in me. He said that ever since he was a small boy, he'd always intended to live in the country and have a garden of his own. He loved flowers. In fact, that's where he first met his wife, when she was working in the flower shop. I never knew that was how they met. How romantic. Of course. Well, like so many who finally fulfil their childhood dream... He was ill-fitted for it, at least to begin with. He had no idea about seeds, cuttings, bedding out, annuals, perennials. He came to me quite often for instruction and noted down my replies in a little book. His garden is beautiful now, all those heavenly scents. Yes, he achieved his vision of it. Mr. Spenlow is a man of patience and persistence. But did his vision include Mrs. Spenlow, I wonder? The Rose Bay willow herb must be in bloom now, all along the river bank. He often strolled back that way after paying me a visit. I suppose we'll have to wait and see if Inspector Slack arrests him. Would you like jam or marmalade? No, neither, thank you. I think I'm going to take a stroll myself. To the Rose Bay willow herb? To see Arthur Spenlow. He could be a murderer. Under suspicion. And surely cunning enough. Not to seal his fate by killing me. I don't care. I don't trust him or you. You've been ill. I'm coming with you and I won't take no for an answer. I wasn't her first husband. Dorothy had been a between maid in a large house in London. Sir Robert Abercrombie's place. Oh, yes. I've heard of it. Beautiful gardens, I'm told. Well, Dorothy must have thought so. She left to marry the second gardener and they started the flower shop together. He fell sick and passed away, but she carried on with the shop and did very well. That's where she made her money. None of it was mine. I had inherited a small jewellery business, but it never prospered. I closed it down shortly after we married. So you could run the flower shop together? Only for a little while. My wife sold her business and invested the proceeds under spirit guidance. Her first husband, that is. I had no idea she was a spiritualist. She always came to Sunday services. Julian had her down as Church of England. Oh, she was that too. Dorothy was very open on such matters. I'm not, I'm afraid, so I didn't take much interest. So, after she invested the money, that's when you moved to St Mary Mead? That's right. We had this vision of what it would be like living here. Me with my garden, her taking an interest in the village happenings, playing bridge, going to church. We did everything we could to make it a reality. But there were still other sides to you both that didn't quite fit in with the vision? I've been quite happy here. Dorothy found it harder. But we rubbed along well enough together. You don't think I killed my wife, do you, Miss Martin? The police think you did. And so does half the village. But I didn't. I would never... I know that's what I would say, which is why I tried not to say anything much to anyone else except for the facts. Or what I believed to be the facts. I truly thought it was you who would phone me. It sounded like me? Well, not exactly, thinking back, but I knew you'd been ill, so I put it down to that. When your maid said you weren't having guests, I assumed you'd had a relapse. I was going to cut you some flowers when I got back, have Mrs. Spenlow make them up into a nice bouquet, but... 
I'm terribly sorry, Miss Smart. Mrs. Harmon. Oh, not at all, Mr. Spender. It must be very distressing. I... I was sincerely attached to my wife. I assure you, I feel her loss very keenly. I was simply not raised to make displays of emotion. That was my Uncle Harry's motto. Never display emotion. He was a man of unusual self-control, and he was also very fond of flowers. They think I strangled her with my belt. They took it from me as evidence. You may get your belt back yet, Arthur. I don't know. He's been very clever. There's no evidence. That's why I couldn't tell Inspector Slag. There's no facts that would help. It would simply incriminate me further to try to point the finger elsewhere. Point the finger at whom? At Ted Gerard, I'd imagine. You know? Not know. As you say, there's been no evidence as such. But there's certainly been speculation. What speculation? Aunt Jane? Uh, look, the willow herb is quite beautiful. I can see why he would have come back this way. About Mrs. Spenlow and Ted Gerard. I never heard any speculation. Well, people wouldn't have wanted to hurt your feelings, dear. Or Julian's. You remember what it was like when you first came to the vicarage? Julian's sermons had quite a magical effect. All the ladies came to the evening service as well as the morning. And many became unusually active in parish work. All those slippers and scarves that were made for him. It was quite embarrassing. <laughs> I think Julian quite liked it. And I found it amusing, flattering. I knew it wouldn't last when they'd got used to him. Not that he isn't a fascinating man, but one always takes things for granted after a while. Oh, it wasn't that they took him for granted, Munch. They simply found another focus for their affection. Uh, one who was rather more available. Ted Gerard. Mm. He had the religious element, good looks and the kind of shady past that some women seem to find exciting. Um, embezzlement, I believe it was. He was never arrested. But when he found God, he confessed to his crimes and gave the money back to his employers. He lost his job and ended up here, living on the charity of an old aunt and the rest of your husband's former admirers. Including Mrs. Spenlow. She wasn't as settled in the country as her husband. You could tell she was casting around for something and was easily influenced by an attractive, charismatic young man. They spent a lot of time together and I have heard it said that she gave him substantial donations of money. But why would he kill her? If she was giving him money, unless maybe she'd refuse to give him any more. Hmm. It may have been about the money. Or it may have been an old-fashioned crime of passion. Don't forget what Mrs. Spenlow was wearing when she was murdered. Her kimono, in the afternoon, when her husband was out. Of course! They must have been having an affair. Well, no, not necessarily. But it's certainly worth paying him a visit. Oh, no, Aunt Jane. I think we've done enough. I think we should go back and tell what we know to Inspector Slam. I'm sure uh, somebody told me that the best tonic was for me to be up and about engaged in something. Not a whistle-stop tour of murder suspects. Mr. Spenlow was one thing, but Ted Gerard is quite another. He could be quite a ruthless young man. Yes, I imagine he could. But surely not to a vicar's wife and an old lady who are paying him a visit out of kindness. <laughs> you slippers. Very kind of you, Miss Marple. Very thoughtful indeed. And Mrs. Harmon, such a lovely scarf. Don't mention it. <laughs> our pleasure. Our churches may differ, but our Lord is the same. I appreciate the gesture. Oh, please have a seat. <laughs> if you can find one, do excuse the mess. Oh, are you moving? Yeah, I'm afraid so. I've just returned from a group meeting in the city, and I've been called upon to spread the word further afield. You know how it is, Mrs. Harmon? Yes. Which train did you catch hmm? into the city? The 227. And I've only just got back. Oh. So you haven't heard the news about Mrs. Spenlow? Mrs. Spenlow? Oh, yes, I, I know the one. What news? She's been murdered. <sighs> That's terrible. The poor lady. I, I must say a prayer for her. You knew her quite well, I think. 
I've tried to get to know the whole community here. Some have been more forthcoming than others. Mrs. Spenlow. She was a good woman at heart, wrestling with many spiritual matters. I tried to be of assistance. I wish she felt she could have come to us for help, too. What kind of spiritual matters were they? You know quite well that we counsel in strictest confidence, Mrs. Harmon. <laughs> All I can say is that I truly hope she is finally at peace. And I hope her killer is wrestling with his own conscience right now. I know what it is like to do wrong. And I know that the only path to redemption is to admit one's guilt and be free. Now, if you'll excuse me, I, I really must get on with my packing. <laughs> What a shame. It can't have been him. Huh. What makes you say that? Well, for a start, he wasn't here when it happened. He may have been seen at the station, but it would be quite easy, wouldn't it, to get on the train and then slip out of the door on the other side before it had even set off? What about the phone call to Mr. Spenlow? Wasn't that made at 2.30? Well, that could have been made by an accomplice. Ted Gerard wasn't going to admit anything to us. But perhaps Inspector Slack can interrogate him before he absconds. He did want to make his arrest today. What did I tell you, Miss Marple? <sighs> By the end of the day. And it's not even dinner time yet. Spenlow will be getting served his dinner very shortly behind bars. But what about Ted Gerard? I have dispatched Constable Polk to take a statement and to take a look at his belt, but the evidence against Spenlow is mounting up by the moment. Did you know that his wife used to work for the Abercrombies? At Sir Robert's London house, yes. Uh, it was the site of a significant jewel robbery. Emeralds worth a packet, taken from a ladyship and never seen again. Turns out Spenlow was a jeweller, perfectly placed to act as the fence. Once you scratch the surface, he becomes a very dubious character. Yes, although, of course, he wasn't married to Mrs. Spenlow at the time. Uh, oh? She was married to Sir Robert's second gardener. Huh. I believe Mr. Spenlow keeps a lot hidden beneath the surface, but that does not make him a murderer. If this Ted Gerard story is true, then Spenlow would have had all the more reason to finish her off. Jealousy is the main motive, and then the money you'd inherit is a bonus. Didn't you find any clues, Inspector, at the scene? <laughs> People don't tend to leave fingerprints and cigarette ash nowadays, Miss Marple. Not usually. But this, I think, was an old-fashioned crime. Well, excuse me a moment, ladies. Oh, dear. I think he might be right. It does all sound rather damning for Mr. Spenlow. An old-fashioned crime. Oh, if my poor old head hadn't been so addled by illness, I might have realised sooner and avoided all of this trouble. Realised what? There you go. That's Tad Gerard's belt. And it's most certainly not our murder weapon. How can you be sure? Observe the width. The belt that was used to strangle Mrs. Spenlow was much narrower, the same width as Mr. Spenlow's belt. I see. Yes, that makes sense. Sorry, Miss Marple, but you can't always be right. Mm -hmm. You go home and get some rest now, eh? Best leave this to me. What ho, in there, Miss Marple? Oh, Are dear. There? Shall we keep walking? do with a sit down. You're not feeling ill again, aren't you? Oh, no, no, no. I just need a moment to myself to think things through. Oh, there you are, Miss Marple. I was beginning to worry that you've been done in too. Your maid seems to have abandoned her duties. Oh, how many times have you called by? No more than half a dozen. She's been slow to answer every time. I'm sorry to say it, Miss Marple, but she's another useless creature like Miss Pollitt. How these women stay in service so long is beyond me. Oh, my. I've just remembered I asked Miss Pollitt to call by about your clothes. She must think we're ever so rude not being here when she called. Oh, I told her to go away. Come back later. Last thing we need is her fussing around us. Now, then, Miss Marple, you did promise to tell me what happened with Inspector Slack. Uh, sorry? Oh, would you mind calling back tomorrow? There's an urgent matter I have to attend to. Oh, is it something to do with the murder? Thank you, Miss Hartnell. Sorry, I, I, I'd better... I, we'll see you tomorrow. Well, yes, I, I'll see you then. Oh. 
Munch, would you please call Miss Pollitt and ask her to come over now uh, about the clothes? I thought you wanted some time to yourself to think. I've done my thinking, and I'd like to see Miss Pollitt. It's good to see you up and about, Miss Marple. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm sorry I missed you earlier, Miss Pollitt. I heard about what happened and assumed you would have forgotten all about me. Miss Hartnell said you were quite shaken. I'll just have to take your new measurements. Have you got a dressing gown you could change into for me? Mrs. Spenlow was wearing her kimono when they found her body, so I heard from Miss Hartnell. Yes, that's what she said. I couldn't bear to look. Inspector Slack had a pin in his jacket that he picked up from the scene of the crime. Actually... No need to get changed. We can just do it as you are. If you could uh, raise your arms for me, please. Yes. <clears throat> he hardly recalls doing it. It's something he's done since childhood. But do you know it wasn't an ordinary pin, the one he picked up today? It was a special pin, very thin, the kind used mostly by dressmakers. How odd. Now, if you could turn around facing away from me. Uh, that's right. I noticed the pin right away, but it took me a little while to realise the significance. What significance can a pin possibly have? Now, let's get to your collar measurement. Head up, please. <clears throat> I would urge you to think twice before turning your tape measure into a deadly weapon again. Into what? Inspector Slack is at the door, along with his men and my goddaughter, who is very concerned for my welfare. There's no way out, Miss Pollitt. No point attacking me. You might as well confess. Confess to what? I had only just arrived at the house. Miss Hartnell saw me. It was Mr. Spenlow who did oh, it. Oh, yes, you set him up very cleverly. Calling him from the post office at 2.30, when the postmistress is busy with the letters from the train. You waited until he left to call on me, and then you went to see Mrs. Spenlow for her fitting. And you got there early strangled her with your tape measure, and then left the house, only to approach again, making sure Miss Hartnell witnessed your arrival. <sighs> Preposterous. Hmm. What possible reason could I have to kill Mrs. Spenlow? She was my friend. Yes, it reminds me of my two cousins, Anthony and Gordon. Whatever Anthony did always went right for him. And with poor Gordon, it was just the other way. Racehorses went lame, stocks went down... Property depreciated. I think you are still feverish, Miss Marple. I don't even believe Inspector Slack is here. Good evening. Miss Pollitt. The lady's maid and the between maid. One got her share of the swag from the Abercrombie jewel theft, married the gardener and grew her fortune with a successful business. I wondered where the money had come from to set up the florists. And as for your share of the swag... Oh, you must have been like Gordon, the unlucky one, still having to make ends meet as the village dressmaker. I expect you were quite envious when she retired here to live the good life. Envious of her? Married <laughs> to him? She was never happy. No, she wasn't. Especially not when she took up with Ted Gerard. She was always religiously inclined and already suffering from attacks of conscience. Ted Gerard no doubt urged her to come clean about the robbery, even if it meant going to prison. She was ready to face that, but you weren't, were you, Miss Pollitt? So you killed her, and you wouldn't care if Mr Spenlow had been hanged for it. I'll take that tape measure, thank you, Miss. Evidence. No, it wasn't my fault. The robbery was all her idea. She made me do it. She made all the money and I ended up with nothing. Why should I go to prison? Why should I? For the murder of Mrs. Spenlow. <laughs> Take it away, lads. <laughs> thank you, Miss Marple. I'm glad you're on the mend. It's your grandmother you have to thank. Find a pin and pick it up. All day long you'll have good luck. <laughs> thank goodness for old women, eh? Is there anything for dinner, Bunch? I think I could manage a little something. In Agatha Christie's Tape Measure Murder, dramatised by Joy Wilkinson, Miss Marple was played by June Whitfield, Bunch by Rosie Cavaliero, 
Inspector Slack's Stephen Critchlow, and Miss Hartnell by Jessica Turner. Miss Pollitt was Alison Pettit, Mr. Spenlow Sam Dale, and Ted Gerard was Chris Pavlo. The director was Gemma Jenkins. Aunt Jane. Raymond. <laughs> what a lovely surprise. Well, what happened to your housemaid? It was Ella, was it? Edna. It's her day off. Oh, I'll bring the cases in later. They'll be fine in the car out here, won't they? Well, I must say. Oh, it's good to get away from London. Uh, sorry. Uh, what cases? Well, didn't Bunch tell you? Bunch is away overseas. Julian was invited to speak at a conference. They'll be away for a month. Exactly. So she asked me to come down and look after you during your convalescence. Oh, I'm quite recovered now, thank you. I told Bunch not to worry herself or anyone else. Oh, Bunch does worry, and rightly so. Can't take any chances at your age. What if you'd collapsed while Ella was out? You know, it's a good job I came when I did. Well, it's very nice to see you, Raymond, but Edna will be back tomorrow, so you'll be safe to go then. Oh, no, I gave Bunch my word. And I'm staying for the whole month until they get back. But uh, what about Joan? Your work? I wouldn't want to keep you away. Oh, no, Joan has all manner of plans for redecoration in my absence. As for the work, I've got a deadline looming, so being stranded in the countryside should be just the thing. What did you think of the last book? Did it get you through the dark days of your malaise? Oh, I'm afraid I haven't had a chance to read it yet. Oh. Well, you'll have plenty of time now I'm here to help. I'll get started on dinner. I've brought my own egg timer. No, I've already started on dinner. Why don't I cook and you make yourself at home in the spare room? You'll be spending a lot of time in there, I imagine, if you're on a deadline. Well, maybe just this once, as you're looking so spry. <laughs> no, I think you'll like this new book. It's not as gruesome as usual, more of an old-fashioned kind of mystery. And you are... Uh, you might even be able to help me with it if I should run into any trouble. Ah, I see. <sighs> to be honest, Aunt Jane, the book's been driving me mad. I had to get away before Joan threw me out. You know, you could be saving my career and my marriage. Well, I'm not sure how much I can help, but the peace and quiet is bound to be good for you. <sighs> We're going to have a great time, Aunt Jane. Just you wait and see. Oh, dear. Agatha Christie's The Case of the Perfect Maid Dramatised by Joy Wilkinson Oh, oh, Edna, you gave me a fright. I'm sorry, ma'am. Weren't you going to have the cold cuts I left for dinner? My nephew Raymond has come to stay. He prefers a hot dinner. Oh, if I'd have known, I'd have made sure I'd been here. Oh, would you like some, Edna? That's very kind, but no thank you, ma'am. You're not coming down with something, are you? Is that why you're back early? No, ma'am. It's not me. It's my cousin, Gladie. She's gone and lost her place and she's so upset about it. Oh, dear me. I'm sorry to hear that, Edna. She does change places quite often, though, doesn't she? Yes, but she's always been the one to give notice. And this time it's the other way around? That's right, ma'am. Hmm. This upset Gladie something awful. The way it happened. The way Miss Lavinia looked. Lavinia Skinner, at Old Hall. And her sister Emily, but she's bedridden, so it's Miss Lavinia who took charge, who gave notice. And gave the look. Oh, why don't you sit down, Edna, and tell me exactly what's happened to Gladdy. It was ever such a shock to her. One of their brooches went missing. Gladdy helped search for it, and there was Miss Lavinia saying she was going to the police, and then it turned up again. Gladdy was so thankful, but then the very next day a plate got broken and Miss Lavinia said that Gladdy was to take a month's pay and go right away, not even oh. work out her notice. And the way she looked. Gladdy was in no doubt that it wasn't about the plate. She's sure they think she stole the brooch and only put it back when the police was mentioned, but she wouldn't do such a thing. Not never she wouldn't. Oh, I'm sure you're right. Your cousin is many things, but she's certainly not dishonest. I, I don't suppose you could go and talk to the Mrs. Skinners, could you, ma'am? 
tell them what you just said about Gladdy not being dishonest. I don't know that Lavinia Skinner is likely to listen to me. I I'm sure she would. Gladdy said she's ever so fond of you. Both of the sisters are. Ah, so did Gladdy suggest that I have a word with them on her behalf? She might have mentioned it, ma'am. Do you mind? No. No, I don't mind. As I'm well again now, I ought to make myself useful. Miss Marple, good to see you out and about again. Good morning, Miss Hartnell. I, I was going to call by to see you later. Wondered if you were aware that your little maid may be related to a thief. I was in the post office yesterday when Lavinia Skinner confessed that she'd had to let her girl go on suspicion of stealing a watch. It was a brooch, not a watch. And Gladdy didn't steal it, nor is any of it a reflection on my Edna. No. Well, of course, Lavinia Skinner is just the type to get the wrong end of the stick. Look at the way she puts up with that hypochondriac sister of hers. All day, every day, she lounges in bed, suffering from various imaginary complaints, refusing to see Dr. Haydock because no humdrum GP could understand her condition. What condition? I don't know, precisely. No one knows. And the only one who falls for it is Lavinia. The way she runs round after her, trotting up to the village whenever Emily fancies something special to partake of, usually something expensive and inconvenient. I think Lavinia likes the walk. You could get a bit cut off out there otherwise. Perhaps that's what sent them all funny at Old Hall. Or perhaps isolated flats just attract those odd types. No, I was, I was quite right. Gladdy is best off out of there. If you could put the word out that Gladdy is innocent, and looking for a new position starting immediately, I'd be much obliged, Miss Hartnell. Well, I'll do what I can, Miss Marple. In fact, I, I, I'm just going to a meeting at the Women's Institute. If you'd like to come with me, put the word out. Yes, oh, I, I'm afraid I have a prior engagement. Uh, Tea with Lavinia Skinner and Emily, if she's feeling up to it. Oh. Well, do give them my regards, won't you? Nice to see you, Miss Marple. Do sit down. Oh, thank you. Emily's in her room, feeling low today, poor dear. But hopefully she'll be up to seeing you shortly. I'm sure it would cheer her up, but there are days when she just can't face seeing anybody. Oh, I was ill myself recently, so I can sympathise. At least you had hope of recovery. Emily's case is not a simple one. Mm. She really is wonderfully patient. Can I get you some tea? I'm afraid you'll have to wait while I make it. Oh, yes. I had heard you'd let your maid go. I had no choice. She broke things. Can't have that. Well, we all have to put up with things nowadays. It's so difficult to get girls to come to the country. Oh, it's a nightmare, I know. That couple downstairs haven't managed to get anyone. But that's no surprise. Always quarrelling, jazz on all night. And that judge has just lost his maid, thanks to his temper and wanting breakfast at six o'clock every morning. <laughs> Mrs Carmichael's Janet is a fixture, but they're both as mad as each other, living with those awful birds. No one else would take the job. <laughs> Given the um, rather eccentric nature of the place, wouldn't it be better to reinstate Gladdy? She really is a nice, honest girl. I know her family. Well, thank you for your concern, Miss Marple, but I really do have my reasons. Something about a brute. The decision has been made. And as it happens, we've been exceptionally lucky and already found a replacement. Already? As luck would have it, I called an agency this morning and found a perfect paragon. She has a three years reference, recommending her most warmly. She prefers the country and actually asks for lower wages than Gladys. I really feel that we've been most fortunate. She sounds almost too good to be true. Oh, she's real enough. Her name is Mary Higgins and she starts tomorrow. It's almost as if it was meant to be. That's exactly how I feel about it, Miss Marple. Now, shall I make that tea while you pop in to see Emily? I'm sure it would do her good just to say hello. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you. Oh, oh, close the door, Miss Marple. Don't let any light in. It's one of my bad days. Probably shouldn't be seeing you. 
Can you see me? I can hardly see a thing. It's so dark in the... Oh, oh! Oh, oh, that's my fan heater. Sorry, I was feeling cold. But then I got too hot. Try not to trip over the flex. Oh, dear. I'll I'll just pop it over here. (sighs) The worst thing about ill health is that one knows what a burden one is to everyone around. Oh, would you... Do you take my hot water bottle to Lavinia? It's on the end of the bed there. Uh, tell her not to put too much water in it, or it weighs on me. Uh, but, but then if it's too empty, it gets cold immediately. Yes, I, I, I'll pass on your instructions. <laughs> yes, Lavinia's so good to me. Could you, could you perhaps ask her if there are any rusks in the house? I'll ask her on my way out. I think you do need a rest. Yes, I think so too. I'm sorry, Miss Marple. Uh, you don't really think that Gladys stole your brooch, do you, Emily? My brooch? Uh, oh well, <laughs> one can't say for sure, but it's well, it's done now, and, and now we have the perfect maid. I do hope so. Would you close the door behind you? It's it's the light. (laughs) The perfect mate. I'm afraid there's no hope of them taking Gladdy back. But Miss Hartnell will try to find her a place. Would you pass me the red wool, dear? Thank you. Thank you for trying, ma'am. Would you like me to make dinner, or is Mr. West doing it for you? Edna, any chance of some dinner? I'm exhausted after toiling away in that room all day. I'll get on to it, sir. You're working too hard, dear. I was wondering, do you remember when we used to play that game? With Joyce and Sir Henry and Dr. Pender and... mm, That little old solicitor... Uh. Mr. Petherick. He's passed away now. So is Dr. Pender. The Tuesday Night Club. That was it. Yeah. I was thinking, if I told you some of a story, whether you might be able to solve it. Just a bit of fun, you know. Oh, very well, dear, if you like. It's about this young rogue, Harry Laxton, Mm -hmm. prodigal son type. Had a torrid affair with the tobacconist's daughter and then swanned off abroad to sow his wild oats. I don't know that this is my kind of story, Raymond. No, but see, he comes back having made good. Married this delicate Anglo-French beauty, Louise, a poor little rich girl, smitten with Harry. So, he buys this old place in the country, Kingsdean, the derelict estate around the dower house where he'd grown up. He pulls down the old mansion and builds this great new pile and brings his bride back to live there. They seem so devoted. Although Louise knows nothing about the tobacconist's daughter, who's now married the village chemist. Harry gives her a wide berth, uses boots in town instead. Very wise. So, everything's happy, until one day they're out riding, and this horrible old woman jumps out into the road, cursing at them, waving her fist. Now, Harry laughs it off, says it's old Mrs Murgatroyd, the wife of the caretaker at Kingsdean. She's been a bit mad since her husband died and is angry at the old house being pulled down. Louise isn't laughing. She thinks the old woman has cursed them. And from then on, she feels like the whole place is cursed. Now, after a few more run-ins with Mrs Murgatroyd, Louise wants to sell up. Harry won't hear of it. Says he'll arrange for the old woman to go out to America and stay with her long-lost son. Louise thinks they'll live happily ever after now. But three days later... When Louise is out riding alone, the old woman jumps out again, and this time the horse bolts. Louise is thrown off, the old woman runs away. Harry runs out, takes Louise in his arms, but it's too late. She's dead. A terrible accident. A very clever murder. (sighs) By Harry, of course, colluding with the old woman. But how could he be sure that the accident would kill her? How could the police make it stick? I'm stuck. Well, the accident didn't kill her. That much is clear. Oh. Is it? 
Well, I suspect Harry paid a visit to the village chemist and got his old flame to equip him with a syringe of something so that he could finish the job off when he took Louise in his arms. Yes, oh, of course. Well, so even if the old woman escaped and Harry was set to inherit his wife's fortune and marry his true love, an astute detective might push for an autopsy. And discover strafanthin. Well, I wouldn't know, dear. But even without that, Harry would have to cover his tracks, kill the old woman. So that's when he could make his fatal error, which gets him caught. Then the strafanthin seals it in court, and we end happily ever after with a hanging. Marvellous. <laughs> I don't know how you do it, Raymond, spending all day cooped up in there with these... Pretend people? That's a good job I have you to talk to. <laughs> Thank you, Aunt Jane. <sighs> Thank you, Raymond. Miss Hartnell, I was hoping to catch you. Have you had any luck finding a place for Gladdy? Good morning, Miss Marble. No, nothing for Gladdy. The only one short of a maid is the judge at Old Hall. Oh, dear. That wouldn't be right, having her next door to the Skinners. Oh, especially not with their new maid to show her up. Have you heard about the marvellous Mary Higgins? Most respectable, soft-spoken, a good old-fashioned type of servant. Nothing like Gladdy. Yes, Gladdy can be rather loud and adenoidal. I'm going up there now to see for myself, or rather to recruit the Mrs. Skinner to be stallholders for the village fate. Will you be helping us, Miss Marple? I could help you right now. I'm on my way to Old Hall via the post office. I can talk to Lavinia about the fate, if you like, save you the journey. Oh. You should go and talk to my nephew. He's a famous writer, Raymond West. He might give a reading at the fate if you ask him nicely. Oh, my. Uh, well, I'd heard you had someone to stay, but I had no idea it was Raymond West. Yes. I shall call by and see him right now. Well, do give Lavinia and Emily my best and let me know what you make of the maid. Good morning, ma'am. Are you here to see Miss Lavinia? Oh, you must be Mary. That's right, ma'am. If you'd just come through. May I take your umbrella and coat? Oh, thank you. I'll keep my bag with me. Miss Marple, what a nice surprise. Come on through. Mary, could you fetch us some tea? I won't be long. I'll go and see to Miss Emily then, ma'am, if there's nothing else. Nothing else. Thank you, Mary. Now then, Miss Emily, can I get you anything? She seems to be everything you'd hoped for. Oh, she really is a godsend, Miss Marple. Cooks nicely, keeps her little flat scrupulously clean, and she's wonderful with Emily. Oh, how is Emily? Might I go and see her? Oh, not today, I'm afraid. Oh. She's been very much under the weather, and with your recent illness, I wouldn't want either of you to take the risk. Oh, dear. So you don't think Emily would be well enough to run a stall with you at the village fair? Oh, we'd love to, but Emily just isn't well enough, and she needs me here to take care of her. Even with Mary on hand? Emily is my sister, and I'm responsible for her well-being. And I wouldn't want Mary to feel put upon and leave. We'd be lost without her. I don't expect she'll leave until she's good and ready. How's your little Edna shaping up? Oh, she's not as good as your Mary. But at least I know all about Edna, with her being a village girl. Miss Emily is asking for you, Miss Lavinia. Oh, dear. Would you excuse me? Oh, well, I'll be on my way. Give my best to Emily. Of course. And I'll see what we can do to contribute to the fate. No doubt we can crochet a few pen wipers. Oh, perfect. If, uh, if you could just help me on with my coat, please, Mary. Certainly, ma'am. Ah, there it is. <laughs> Here we Thank go, ma'am. Um, do you want me to hold your... Oh, oh, I'm so sorry, my bag. Now look at everything. What a mess. That's all right, ma'am. I can help. Oh, would you mind? Thank you. My back isn't what it was, and so many things. I really should clear it out. Oh, thimbles, loose change, handkerchiefs. Oh, 
half-eaten stick of peppermint rock. Oh, my. How did that get in there? It must have been Mrs. Clement's little boy in the post office. Yes, I remember him sucking on it. He must have put it inside there for a joke. <laughs> it's terribly sticky, isn't it? Shall I get rid of it for you, ma'am? Oh, yes, please. If you could just pass me my mirror. How lucky that wasn't broken. Your umbrella, ma'am. Oh, yes, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Mary. You really are the perfect maid. Good day, ma'am. It's a shame Bunch is away. She loves the village fate. Yes, but if she was here, you wouldn't have me to liven things up. I'm doing a reading of the new story at four o'clock. If they can bear the excitement after the dog show. So your story is finished? Well, thanks to you, Aunt Jane. And I'll be heading off tonight. Bunch is on her way back. Joan wants me to approve some wallpaper, and oh, you don't seem to need much looking after. Oh, it's a shame to see you go. I was hoping we might get to play the Tuesday night club one more time. Oh, we can play it now, if you like. You got a story? Uh, most of one. But I'm not sure of the solution yet. Perhaps I've got it wrong. I was so sure. Oh, Miss Marple, mm. there you are. Have you heard about the Skinners? They've been robbed by that so-called paragon of theirs. Mary Higgins. It's a common thief. She's taken two brooches, three rings, and a bracelet from the sisters. But worse than that, she must have had keys made for the other flats because she's stolen from them, too. Are the sisters still there? As far as I know. Although there's already talk of them moving out, subletting. Raymond, fetch your car. I need a lift to Old Hall. Uh, what about my reading? Well, if you hurry, we'll be back in time. Right you are. Um, Miss Hartnell, please, can you alert Inspector Slack? Have him meet me at the Skinner's. What's going on, Miss Ma? Well, I'll tell you, I promise, if you fetch Inspector Slack. I didn't mean quite that fast, Raymond. Now, are you going to tell me what all this is about? I might have told you on the way if I could have caught my breath. As it is, I must conserve my energy for the stairs. Will you come up with me? It's 20 to 4. My readings Yes, are... yes, yes, but this could give you another story. And if Inspector Slack isn't here soon, I may need your help. Miss Marple. Lavinia, this is my nephew, Raymond West. I wanted to come as soon as I heard the news. Oh, that's ever so kind of you, Miss Marple. And, um... Raymond. But as you can imagine, we're, we're in terrible disarray. The police were here all morning, but there's nothing they can do. But no hope of catching Mary. She's vanished into the blue. The agency says the woman who came here was a different person altogether. They have no idea who our Mary Higgins was. Well, she certainly wasn't Mary Higgins, we can be sure of that. Inspector Slack had heard of a similar case in Northumberland last year. They never caught her either. He's got no hope of recovering our treasures, nor of bringing that woman to justice. Poor Emily is inconsolable. I, I have to get back to her. Sorry. Oh, perhaps we could come in and see her? I don't think so. She's, she's in no fit state. I'm going to take her up to London right away to see her specialist. He's the only one who understands her case. I think I may understand it, too. I'm sorry, what's that supposed to mean? I mean... Oh, dear. I hope I shall be able to put what I say properly. So difficult to explain oneself, isn't it? Excuse me. Um, I thought I said you can't come in. Sorry about this. Aunt Jane. Excuse me, Miss... Raymond, you can't suppose... Oh, it's difficult to explain. But when you come across a peculiar thing, you notice it. Even though peculiar things may be the merest trifles, like Gladys on the brooch, she didn't take it. So why would you think she did? Why would you get rid of her so swiftly? I, I explained all this. 
I shouldn't have to explain. And another peculiar thing, Miss Hartnell pointed out your sister Emily is the only hypochondriac who never wanted to see a doctor. Hypochondriacs love doctors. Emily is not a hypochondriac. Hmm. She's not a lot of the things that she seems to be, I suspect. It wouldn't surprise me in the least if that hair of hers wasn't a wig. If that thin, pale, grey-haired, whining woman is the same as the black-haired, rosy-cheeked, plump woman who was Mary Higgins. Your aunt is out of her mind. Yes, possibly, but I'm riveted. Go on, Aunt Jane. Nobody ever saw Emily and Mary together. But we can see now. If we take a look at Emily... Don't! Leave her alone! Uh, quick, Aunt Jane! The curtains, Raymond, and watch out oh. for the fan heater. Oh, no! Oh, Emily! And Mary Higgins, one of the same. Lavinia, run! I don't think so, Lavinia. Uh. Oh, you little... She bit me! Oh, I'm on, Miss Skinner. What's going on? You've caught the thief, Inspector Slack. Hey? Eh? One of them. The other one is here, Emily Skinner. Otherwise known as Mary Higgins. <laughs> Sorry, I don't follow her. Well, me neither. I'm sure she's right, as ever. You can't prove anything. Oh, we probably can, with my mirror, covered in Mary's sticky fingerprints, which will match Emily's and the fingerprints <laughs> from the Northumberland case. You sneaky old cow. Nice work, Miss Marple. But how the devil did you know? <laughs> I don't believe in paragons. We all have our faults, and domestic service shows them up very quickly. <laughs> Real-life Tuesday night club in action. Except this time I got the ending first. Maybe I can use that. Don't think about it whilst you're driving, Raymond. Thank you for recommending Gladdy to your friend, Mr. West. She's ever so excited to work in London. The perfect place for restless souls. Thanks, Aunt Jane. You were the tonic after all. We did have some fun, didn't we? I'll have to come back and stay again. When I need my next story. <laughs> Yes. In Agatha Christie's The Case of the Perfect Maid, dramatized by Joy Wilkinson, Miss Marple was played by June Whitfield, Raymond West by Raymond Coulthard, Inspector Slack Stephen Critchlow, and Miss Hartnell by Jessica Turner. Lavinia Skinner was Claudie Blakely, Emily Skinner Tracy Wiles, and Edna was Alex Tregear. The director was Gemma Jenkins. Oh, it's so cold, Aunt Jane. Are you sure you shouldn't stay at home? Go back to bed. Oh, it's only a little flower arranging, my dear bunch. I'm sure I can manage. Oh, Julian only heats the church at service times. It'll be as cold as the grave in there. Well, my bed might be warm, but it's one step closer to the grave. Oh. Look at poor Mr. and Mrs. Munday. She had a stroke a week ago, and now he's come down with pneumonia. I know. That's why I'm trying to make you look after yourself. I'd rather be making myself useful. Oh! Oh, oh, oh. Arthur! Arthur! Would you mind holding the flowers so I can get it? Oh, no, I, I, I'll get it. Oh, Oh, <laughs> thank you. Oh, a little rakish. <laughs> but it suits you. <laughs> thank you, Aunt Jane. <laughs> now let's get inside before we catch our deaths. Oh. Mm. <laughs> oh, I wish we had some lilies. I get so tired of these scraggy chrysanthemums. Well, it may be chilly, but... Oh, see the sun through the east window. Oh, like jewels, isn't it? I often think the coloured glass is quite crude, but when the light shines Bunch, through it... Look, on the chancel steps. Is he all right? Oh, I don't know. He could be sleeping. Hello? Hello, sir. Perhaps we should fetch Julian. Excuse me, sir. Are you all right? <laughs> Sanctuary. Oh, my. He's been shot. Uh, don't move, please. Don't try to move. I'll get help. Sanctuary. Go, Bunch, quickly. Oh. I'll be safe with him here. Oh, will you? Are you sure? Oh, my. Go before oh. it's too late. 
it's all right. It's all right. You're safe here. Help is on its way. Jew. Yes, the light is pretty. Or did you mean Julian? Did you come here to find him? If you could tell me. Please. Please. Oh. Oh, no. Oh, Bunch. Bunch. Agatha Christie's Sanctuary. Dramatized by Joy Wilkinson. We moved him in here, Julian and I and Dr. Haydock. We thought he'd be more comfortable, but he never regained consciousness. Internal bleeding. There was nothing more he could have done. No. That's what the doctor said, didn't he, Aunt Jane? Hmm. He'd been shot at close quarters, rolled his handkerchief up into a ball and plugged the wound with it in an attempt to stop the bleeding. Oh. The poor man. Could he have gone far, Inspector, with a, with a wound like that? Well, a mortally wounded man has been known to pick himself up and walk along the street as though nothing had happened, only to collapse ten minutes later. <laughs> the shooting could have occurred some distance from here. That's something, if it didn't happen in the church. He could have shot himself, dropped the revolver and staggered towards the church. Uh, I suppose he may have regretted the suicide, wanted some kind of forgiveness or... Sanctuary? That's what he was looking for. That's what he said when we found him. Sanctuary. And Julian. Although my husband is certain that he never knew the man. It may have been Jewel, not Julian. He could see the light from the east window. Did he say anything else? Nothing that made any sense. He said, please, twice. They were his last words. Please what? I don't know. He was grasping at his side as he said it. It was as though he wanted me to do something, but I don't know what. You did everything you could, Aunt Jane. Oh, come this way, Inspector Slack. I have things from his coat. Oh. Here, look. There was just his wallet, an old watch, and the return half of a ticket to London. Mm -hmm. I hope you don't mind that we went through his coat. There was blood all over, and we were trying to find out who he was. Oh, there are some initials on the watch. Oh. Uh, W.S. Oh, well, that's a start. I'll get back to the station, see what more I can find out. Please do call if there's any news. I will, and you take good care of your aunt. Oh, I will. Oh, that was a delicious dinner bunch. You barely touched it. <gasps> but now I really should be going home. Oh. I've told you, you're welcome to stay the night. We've got plenty of room. Um, shouldn't you answer that? Only if you promise not to vanish while I'm gone. I promise. Go along now, it could be important. Sanctuary. Jewel. Please. Please. Oh, Jane, you've put your coat on. I told you, dear, I'm going home. That was Inspector Slack. It's all been solved, the man. You know who he is? His name was Sandborn. His sister, a Mrs Eccles, she called the police to say he'd gone missing from their home in London and had taken her husband's revolver with him. He'd been depressed. They think he came here from London and shot himself? He'd been in a low state for some time and getting worse. But why come here? Did he know someone here? Inspector Slack didn't say. I suppose when someone is unwell like that, there's no accounting for how they behave. Mm, I suppose so. It's a huge relief, though, isn't it? That it wasn't a murder? Yes, dear. If that is indeed the case. Mrs Eccles wants to pay us a visit tomorrow. Me, I mean. You don't have to be here. I could get Julian to help out. Oh. A clergyman is so useful when people are bereaved. No, I'd like to be here to meet her. If your very kind offer to stay is still open... It's been a terrible shock, as you can imagine. A terrible shock. Yes, I'm sure it must have been. Can I offer you some tea, Mrs. Eckhart? Oh, no, no. It's very kind of you, I'm sure. But I, I just came to, well, to find out about poor William. What happened, what he said and all that, you know. Do you really think your brother could have shot himself? 
He'd been abroad a long time. I know he'd had some very nasty experiences, though he never said what. Very quiet and depressed he's been ever since he came home. It said the world wasn't fit to live in. There was nothing to look forward to. Oh, poor Bill. He always was a troubled soul. Oh, dear. I thought you'd fetch Julian. <laughs> you think William took your husband's revolver? Pinched it, he did, without our knowing. And then it seems he came here to finish it. I suppose that was nice on his part, not doing it in our house. But why come here, of all places? Well, that's what I was wondering, Miss Marple. If he said anything, giving you any clues to what he was thinking? He said sanctuary. Sanctuary? Well, what's that mean? I asked my husband. In Greek and Roman temples, it meant the place where the statue of a god would be put. In Christianity, you have the right of sanctuary in a church. Since the 4th century, my husband says. Oh, right. I think it means he chose here because it's a holy place. It makes sense if he took his life that he might want to make amends. What do you think it means, Mrs Eccles? I have no idea. No idea at all. Sorry. I should let you get on with your day. A vicar's wife is a busy lady, I know that. Oh, I really don't mind if you'd like to stay and talk. You're very kind, but I've so much to do. Oh, I almost forgot one other thing. I think you've got his coat. The police said you had it, and I'd, I'd like to take all of his things, you know, sentimental-like. Oh, well, I gave the inspector everything from the pockets, his wallet and watch. What about the coat? Oh, well, it was such a mess. I... Oh, I'm not even sure what I did with it. I believe it went upstairs with the towels and basin. Oh, yes, it needed a proper clean. It was so stained. Could I have it back, please? What, what now? Before it's been cleaned? But that doesn't matter. It's the last thing that he wore. I'd really like to have it, if it's not too much trouble, please. No, of course, it's I'll no trouble. I'll get it, Bunch. You stay here. Mm. I won't be a moment. going to be long up there? I'm sorry. Perhaps I should check if she's all right. She may have had a spell. She hasn't been very well lately. Oh, I'm so sorry. The daily woman had put it aside with the other clothes that were going to the cleaners. It took a while to find and, and then I'd done it up in brown paper. Oh, you didn't need to do that, Miss Marple. Oh, I wanted to. To do anything I can for Mr Sanborn. Well, it's appreciated, I'm sure. I'll be uh, on my way now. No need to show me out. I don't feel like I was any help. Perhaps I should have got Julian in to console her. I don't think she was really in need of any consolation. What do you mean? I don't believe she was his sister. He knew what sanctuary meant, the way Julian knows. He was well-read, educated, nothing like her. I'm not sure that's fair, Aunt Jane. Julian is much better read than I am, much cleverer in every way. People can be completely different, however closely related they are. You are a clever bunch. <sighs> but on this matter, I'm sure you're mistaken. She had no interest in the wallet or the watch, but the way she wanted his coat, that old, shabby, blood-stained coat, just as it was... That wasn't for sentimental reasons. Why else would it be? When he said jewel, he might not have meant the light. The way he kept grasping at his side made me wonder. You think there were jewels hidden in the coat? No, but there was something in there. When I found the coat, I saw that the lining had been sewn up with a different thread in one place, so I unpicked it and I found a little piece of paper inside... And then I sewed it up again quickly with matching thread. That's why I took so long. But luckily, I'm an old lady who takes a while to do things, so she shouldn't have reason to suspect anything. Aunt Jane, I'd been worried that you'd been ill up there. What was the piece of paper? It was this. A cloakroom ticket for Paddington Station. A cloakroom ticket? Mr Sanborn had a return ticket to Paddington in his pocket. Hang on. A return ticket? Doesn't that prove that he was planning to go back? Not planning to commit suicide. Clever girl. But someone had other plans. Oh, maybe Mrs Eccles or, or someone she's in league with. And they shot him 
because they want whatever he's got hidden. At Paddington Station. That's why he said please. He wanted me to find the cloakroom ticket before Mrs. Eccles. No wonder she was so desperate to get that coat. This calls for action. I'll call Inspector Smith. No, not just yet, Bunch. I was thinking more of a nice trip up to London. We could go to the sales, get a few new towels and sheets, pass through Paddington Station. Really, Aunt Jane? Are you sure you're up to that? Oh, it's remarkable what effect the proximity of death can have. I've never felt more alive, and it's my responsibility that poor man begged me. But shouldn't we leave it to the police? We're only collecting an item from the cloakroom. It'll be perfectly safe. As long as we're not followed. Followed? We'll go right now and call by to see Edna on the way. I think I'll be needing the old speckled tweed with the beaver collar. Bunch, do you really need more glass cloths? Always, and they're very cheap. Although not as cheap as the ones that awful woman managed to snatch from me. People are ruthless when there's money to be saved. Or jewels to be gained. Mm -hmm. Oh, look. There's Edna. Oh. Uh, Edna! Oh, nice to see you here, Miss Marple. So kind of you to give me the afternoon off. Well, you're still working after a fashion. Have you got that um... envelope? Ma'am, here you are. Excellent. Now then, off you pop and have a lovely afternoon. I'll see you back at home this evening. Enjoy the sales, ma'am. Don't go overdoing it. I've only bought a face cloth. Don't worry, Edna. I'll take care of her. <laughs> now, if you've got enough glass cloths, let's make a phone call to Inspector Slack before we go home. Via the cloakroom at Paddington? Have you got the ticket? I have indeed. Tired, Aunt Jane. The sails are enough to tire anyone out. You'd better let me carry the case when we get back. Oh, it isn't heavy. No, but if someone has followed us and tries to take it, then I don't want you getting hurt. Someone most certainly has followed us, and they will try to take it, which is why I should be the one carrying it. I don't want you ending up like poor Mr. Sanborn. I don't want you ending up that way either. Well, better that than ending up like poor Mrs. Monday. Oh. I knew we should have let the police deal with this. The police should be there if Inspector Slack got my message. Oh, here we are. Please let me carry the case, Aunt Jane. Do stop fussing, Bunch. I'm trying to look after you. Yes, but there comes a point where you can't. Sorry, Bunch. I have to do this. You understand? Very well. But I'm here if you need me. Not too close, Bunch. I don't want you to put him off. Who? Where is he? Are the police here yet? You go and check. I'll just wait here. Oh. Let go of the case, old lady. I beg your pardon. You heard me, and I'm not going to say it again. You let go of her. No, Bunch, get back. I said, let go. Oh. Watch it! I'm not letting go. So don't you think of running. Uh, <coughs> oh, steady there, madam. Almost had a nasty fall. Now then, what's <laughs> going on, sir? Oh, nothing. It's just this uh, this old lady picked up my case. I was merely trying to retrieve my rightful property. Are you all right, Aunt Jane? <laughs> Quite unharmed. But I assure you, sir, the case is mine. Well, there's a simple way to settle this. If the case is yours, sir, what do you say is in it? Well, here's my card. I'm Edwin Moss, a theatrical costumier. This suitcase contains various theatrical properties which I brought down here for an amateur performance. Right, sir. And, and, and madam, what do you say is inside? A long speckled coat with a beaver collar and two wool jumpers. And a pair of shoes. Oh, of course, I forgot. Ah, just like you got my case mixed up. <laughs> Typical old lady. <laughs> well, let's have a look inside and see then, shall we? <clears throat> A beaver coat, two jumpers, and a pair of shoes. Oh, oh, oh. But, it, but it can't be. Because you saw me collect it from the cloakroom. But you didn't see my housemaid switch tickets with me beneath the face cloth. 
face cloth. What? Well, I don't know what you're talking about. I'd better go and find my case. No, not so fast, Mr. Moss. I think you've got some explaining to do at the police station. May we call in at my house on the way, Inspector Slack? I think Edna should be back soon, and I'd like to see what she has picked up in London. She's not back yet, but I can put the kettle on. No, take a seat, Bunch, please. Oh. I'm sure you'll find whatever Mr. Moss has to say most diverting. Go on, Moss. If you come clean now, it could go better for you in court, depending on what you've done, of course. Well, I haven't done anything. It was all her idea. Mrs. Eccles, you mean? She's not Mr. Sanborn's sister, is she? She does have a brother who's been abroad and come back a bit touched in the head, but he's still alive. Unlike Bill Sanborn. So who was he? I can help you out there, Mrs. Harmon. It's what I've been looking into this afternoon. We got notification about a prisoner who escaped from Charrington Prison around 48 hours ago. His description matches the dead man's. Sanctuary. Of course. He was being hunted down by the law, so he took sanctuary in the church. Why was he in prison? What had he done? He was a jewel thief many years back now. Maybe Mr. Moss here can tell us more about that. There was a dancer doing turns at the music halls. I don't expect you'll have heard of her, but she had this speciality act. Arabian Nights, like. Uh, Aladdin in the Cave of Jewels, it was called. A certain member of an Asiatic royal family fell for her in a big way. He gave her a rather magnificent emerald necklace. The historic jewels of a Raja. And the affair didn't last, and he soon moved on to a film star, leaving Zubeda, that was her stage name, with only a necklace. But she didn't have that for long. It disappeared from her dressing room at the theatre one night and was never seen again. Now, she said it was stolen, but there was a lingering suspicion that she might have engineered it herself for some reason. And what do you think happened to it, Mr Moss? Me? I know what happened to it. William Sanborn pinched it. He'd once been a man of some education and breeding, but he'd come down in the world and was working for an obscure little jewellery firm that acted as a, a fence for robberies. And that's how you came across him, I presume, when he acted as a fence for you and Mrs Eccles? Well, for Mrs Eccles, certainly. But I, I'm just a muscle, if you will. I do as I'm told. I don't make any decisions. So Mr Sanborn stole the necklace and went to prison for it? No, Sanborn went to prison for acting as a fence in several other jewel robberies, but... no one ever knew what became of Zubeda's emerald necklace. Oh, we knew all right. And we knew that he knew. So when we got word from our contacts inside that he'd escaped, Mrs Eccles got straight on the case. To get hold of the suitcase, which you believed contained the jewels. We tracked him from London to here, caught up with him behind the station, we tried to make him see sense, tell us where the jewels were hidden, but he wouldn't play ball. Mrs Eccles got angry, tried to make him talk, but even with the bullet in him, he still wouldn't. He wouldn't breathe a word. He just stared at us. A deaf cold stare and walked away. And she told me to follow him and finish him off, but I, I, I couldn't. I that look in his eyes. I couldn't understand it. Why would you give up your life for some jewels? Well, you've risked your life for some jewels, Mr. Moss. You may yet lose it if the jury don't believe your story. If they think you... Pulled the trigger. Well, I, I'm just the idiot who runs around after her. Look at me, sent to accost old ladies on train stations. And I've even messed that up. If you don't kill me, Mrs Eccles will. No chance of that. My lads are arresting her right now. Ah, here comes Edna. Hopefully with Mr Sanborn's suitcase. I tried to have a peek, but it's locked fast. Oh, shall I get a chisel, Inspector Slack? Have you got a chisel? The stronger of the two pallet knives will do, Edna. Won't be a tick. Oh, I still don't understand how your maid got hold of it. I think he may be right, Inspector Slack. About Mrs Eccles being the brains of the operation, it's quite simple, really, Mr Moss. I had Edna come up to London on the next train, after us, and deposit a case of my old clothes in the cloakroom at Paddington. Then... She swapped her ticket for the ticket I had, which belonged to Mr. Sanborn. So I collected the case of clothes, 
and you followed me back, leaving Edna free to collect this case in safety. Here you go, Inspector. Uh, thank you. Now, here we go. <gasps> oh. Oh. <laughs> Aladdin's cave. The flashing jewels she wore to dance. Oh, I don't get it. Where's the necklace? That's just her costume. Well, look at the costume. What if you were right, and Zubeda did plan the theft of the necklace with Mr. Sanborn, who was a jeweller? He took the stones from their setting and fastened them here and there on her theatrical costume, where everyone would take them for mere coloured rhinestones. That's why the necklace was never seen again. She made sure it went missing before anyone more unscrupulous tried to steal it. Mrs. Eccles, for instance. So the jewels were there all along, on the costume. Oh, Mrs. Eccles is going to go mad. Both you and Mr. Sanborn were under the spell of very clever women, Miss Moss. But I think William may have meant more to Zabeda than you do to Mrs. Eccles. How do you know that, Aunt Jane? Because of this suitcase. Zabeda must have left him her jewels when she died. Well, she is dead, isn't she? Mm, died last year. And in her dying days, she sent the cloakroom ticket to Mr. Sanborn, the love of her life, for when he got out. Very clever, Miss Marple, but that doesn't explain why Sanborn broke out of prison now to get the jewels. Or why he came here with the ticket. Or why he used every last ounce of energy in him to make it to the church for sanctuary and for help. Let's see if there are any answers in here. Could you... Lift the costume, please, Inspector. It is rather heavy. Hardly surprising, the size of those jewels. Hmm. <gasps> An envelope. I had a feeling there might be. Wasn't it, Miss Marple? A marriage certificate between William Sandborn and Mary St. John. Oh, that was Zubeda's real name. So she did love him. What oh, romantic. And a birth certificate for their daughter... Jewel. Jewel? That's what he said in the church. And that's why he came here now and wouldn't give up the ticket. He came here to give it to his daughter, Jewel. But there's no one in the village called Jewel. No, but there's a nice, quiet girl who might have changed her name to something a little less unusual. Jill, perhaps? Jill? The little girl who lives with the Mondays. Their goddaughter, taken in when her father went to prison and treated as their own. But now, with Mrs. Mundy's stroke and Mr. Mundy falling ill, she's likely to be sent away to live in an institution, which is why her father risked everything to get here and make sure she got this, her inheritance. This will set her up for life. A nice boarding school. A place of her own one day. He wanted her to have it, even if it meant him losing his life. Does that make sense, Mr. Moss? Of that look in his eyes? It wasn't just some jewels you wanted him to give up. It was his daughter's future. And he was willing to die for it. But now, thanks to you, Miss Marple, her future will be safe. Well, as yours, Mr Moss, well, <laughs> we'll have to wait and see. Oh, I had no idea he had a daughter. I swear, I I'm sorry. This I way, Moss. Mind if I take the case with me, Miss Marple? Of course. I'll make sure it's kept safe for young Jill. Oh, I do hope he took the right case. She won't be able to fun much with that old beaver collar. Oh, thank you, Bunch. You brought lilies. Oh, lovely. So much nicer than those chrysanthemums. They're not for the church's flower arrangements, sorry. They're for Mr. Sanborn's grave. Oh, where is it? Over here. Let me take your arm. It's a little uneven on the grass. Oh, I can manage, Bunch. It was only the other day I was fending off a violent attacker. And I still haven't forgiven you for that. <laughs> Look. Here it is. Oh, yes. William Sanborn. Beloved husband and father. Well, William, these are for you. Oh. There. Rest in peace. I hope you found sanctuary. Why don't you come back to the rectory for tea? I'm sure Julian would love to see you. Oh, thank you, Bunch, but not now. 
I think I'll go home. You're not feeling ill again, are you? I know I'm fine. No need to fuss. Very well. I think I'll walk back along the river bank. Look at the rose bay willow herb while it's still in bloom. Goodbye, my dear bunch. Goodbye, Aunt Jane. In Agatha Christie's Sanctuary, dramatized by Joy Wilkinson, Miss Marple was played by June Whitfield, Bunch by Rosie Cavaliero, Inspector Slack Stephen Critchlow, Edna Alex Tregear, Mrs. Eccles Sally Orrock, and Edwin Moss by Michael Shelford. The director was Gemma Jenkins. Mm -hmm.